everybody. Thank you for joining me. My name's Amy Hodler. We're going to talk a little bit about machine learning drift and how to identify issues before they become big problems. I like to start with fundamentals or basic principles. Uh, the assumptions when we do machine learning is that are the data and the logic that we're using for training somehow mimics the real world. If we didn't believe that, uh, we wouldn't have a lot of faith in our predictions, and hopefully we wouldn't be putting our models into production. Unfortunately, the real world tends to change on us. I, I, sometimes, the, sometimes quite quickly, sometimes gradually, uh, but when that happens, that the data that we originally use, that training data, um, which was static, can be very different than what's happening in the real world, uh, whether there was a, actually a data issue or whether the fundamentals change. Um, the pandemic is a perfect example. People are shopping more for yoga pants versus um, dress pants uh, during that time frame, so that our predictions um, changed, or rather they became less um, less accurate. And so machine learning model drift, very simply put, just means that over time, our ML models drift away from accuracy and they make poor predictions. Uh, so that's just a very simple definition. It sounds rather logical and maybe something that you would expect and wouldn't be a big deal, but in actuality, it can actually have very big impact. And so we've had customers that say, hey, over a weekend, I had a model drift that cost us $500,000. Uh, whether you're talking about uh, poor predictions, poor recommendations, whether you're talking about missing fraud or predicting too much fraud inaccurately, um, those things can have very bottom line impact for a lot of high value models. Uh, it can also have impact to teams. So another customer says that it took them uh, two weeks to correct and troubleshoot a problem. And those during those two weeks, their data scientists weren't doing other work. And it was slowing down getting the model back into production, which also has uh, major impact. So it has real impact. And how we experience drift varies quite a bit as well. We might experience a sudden abrupt shift uh, pandemic, again, things change really quickly. Uh, and it was clear, you know, maybe from one day to the next or from one month in the, to the next that the predictions were no longer accurate. Or maybe it's gradual changes or incremental changes, especially with the value where you have kind of a slower change. And it may not be apparent um, that you have a big problem for, for quite some time. It can it often uh, models fail very silently. Or you might see something reoccurrently and you keep shifting for it and you either have a seasonal change or maybe it's a weekend change uh, or you know something that happens um, with some frequent um, periodicity. Or you might see something that is a blip. And the thing about blips, uh, they might just be an outlier, not a drift issue, but you don't you might not know the difference at first. And so that I, I like to think about that um, as well when you're you're evaluating for your machine learning drift. Now, there are several key types of drift to be aware of. Um, this picture is just showing training data with a little dotted line um, for your decision boundary. So you trained uh, a classifier to say um, orange dots or blue dots, and it just gives you, you know, kind of a probability of one or the other, depending on some input. The first type of drift to think about is concept drift. And this is where the relationship, the probability uh, of whether something is blue or uh, orange actually changes uh, and the or a behavior of people have actually changed, um, but not necessarily the input data. So behavior change, relationship change is the way to think about concepts uh, changing. When we think about data drift, a little asterisk here um, because we're going to be we're going to get a little more precise. But here, the data has actually changed. Either your incoming or your outcoming data has changed, but the fundamental relationship, the decision boundary, uh, is still holding valid. It's just you're getting different information. Now, to be more precise, people usually like to talk about label drift and feature drift. Label drift is a drift and a change in the output. Uh, data. So your ground truth is changing, your probability of why is changing. Feature is actually a drift in the input data. So the um, type of people actually applying for your loan, um, the probability of X is actually changing. 
Now, these changes can influence uh, how accurate your model is, or they might not. Um, the last little picture here on the bottom is a situation where your data has changed. In this case, your little um, orange circles uh, have changed, but the uh, if you keep the decision boundary the same, your model's still working. Now, the thing here is uh, your model might still work and it might still be accurate, but understanding that you have had either a label um, drift or a feature drift is important for other reasons, including being a signal of um, future performance issue. So to give you an example of the three different types, to make it a little, a little clearer, I'm going to give you a loan example, or at least loan application model. And in the first stance, uh, talking to concept drift again, your, let's say, macroeconomic um, factors have changed. And so your in uh, an income level that you originally considered credit worthy is no longer um, considered appropriate. It's now considered higher risk for uh, mass economic reasons. Uh, and so in that case, you may want to, um, you know, shift or retrain your model. Or perhaps label drift. So in this case, you're having a larger portion of uh, applicants that are credit worthy uh, have started showing up. The macroeconomics haven't changed, but maybe you've launched some major massive um, campaign in a more affluent area, and therefore you're getting people who are more um, credit worthy applying. Um, that may be a great thing, or it might be something your business isn't ready for if you weren't intending to uh, make that many loans. Uh, you might also have feature drifts. So in this case, the input features are actually changing. So maybe the income levels of most of your applicants are either increasing or decreasing. Uh, you suddenly get more applicants for one region that perhaps have different income or debt to income ratios. Uh, and so kind of understanding that and seeing that happen ahead of time can help you understand why your performance is changing. So some quick examples there of um, drift in a loan application. And you might be asking, okay, what, what triggers these drift? What we just talked about, um, your triggers would either be real changes, label, feature, has changed, input out has changed, concept might have changed, or you might have a data integrity issue. So let's say uh, you have uh, correct data coming in, but your actual, your engineering actually made a mistake uh, and they've swapped the values uh, of two fields. Maybe your age value and your debt to income ratio value has, has, uh, has accidentally been flipped, would cause some problems. Uh, or you're actually getting incorrect data or missing data. So let's say you have a, your front end loan application um, had an update and now it's allowing null values. And that's a, a, a key field for making a decision. And so those are the two things that tend to cause machine learning model drift. Now, at this point, if you're asking me like, okay, but but what's actually important, Amy? Um, I'm not sure what's really changed. Um, do I have to know all these different terms? It's important to be grounded, but it's probably more important to understand uh, how do I detect issues, regardless of what we want to call them? How do I analyze for root cause? And then how do I fix it? Uh, so if you're trying to detect drift issues, you need to know whether you have labels and have them in the time uh, that you need them or not. If you do have labels, performance monitoring, supervised learning uh, is the way to go. If you don't or they're lagging, you want to look for data drift monitoring and um, unsupervised learning are methods you can use. Now, performance monitoring and supervised learning um, work, again, if you've got labels, fantastic. If you know your ground truth, um, you can just put in some very easy uh, metrics, looking at statistical measures, uh, how accuracy, you know, how accurate is this overall? Um, what's my false positive rate, uh, precision rate, whatever you want to measure. There are a lot of tools out there, including Fiddler, uh, that has the ability to put in what I would call these low hanging fruit methods to so just monitor and know what your performance is at all times. You can also decide to develop your own. And there are a number of supervised learning techniques. Um, this paper that I've mentioned here, a survey of concept drift adaptation, as a really good uh, overview of things like sequential analysis, um, statistical process uh, controls, which is kind of interesting because you can look at the rate of change as well, and also doing things like monitoring for multiple distribution changes, which can be very precise, but also have more overhead. Um, so you have some number of tools out of the box, but also uh, you can uh, develop your own methods as well.
Now, if you do not have labels, remember that the training was done on the static snapshot of the real world. And that uh, often shifts or uh, the real world keeps shifting over time. And so understanding what the distribution of the data is that's coming in compared to and how it diverges to what you trained on can be an early indicator of issues. So I've listed a number of um, distribution metrics here. Um, popular, uh, population stability index is uh, popular in the financial industry. Um, but there are also a number of other methods like the KL divergence, uh, the Jensen-Shannon divergence, which is based on KL, uh, but has some changes to, to make it um, symmetric and um, always have a finite value, which is a good thing. Uh, and then if you have an unusual distribution or rather, you know, you don't have a nice average um, distribution, you can use something like the, the Komogorov um, Shmirnov test, the KS test, um, that uh, doesn't require a parametric value. So um, some number of different methods. Um, Fiddler uses the Jensen Shannon method. Uh, again, there are out of the box tools that you can use or you can develop or work uh, on your own. If you decide to use your own or develop your own unsupervised learning techniques, there are a number of um, unsupervised and semi-supervised uh, learning techniques. Uh, this paper, an overview of unsupervised drift detection methods, uh, has a, a great list. I've copied uh, a graphic from that paper in here. Uh, they can be very accurate, especially the online methods that are looking at each instance. Uh, but there's also a lot of overhead with that. Batch methods are, you know, tend to be more efficient. Um, these metrics tend to be, or this machine learning models tend to be globally oriented, which means they may miss gradual shifts or regional shifts. Um, they may have some sensitivity issues as well, so just be aware of that. Um, the other, th and probably the biggest drawback, is they're very difficult to explain um, to different teams uh, why um, why you're uh, expecting or seeing this kind of drift um, versus a statistical method that is uh, just kind of easier for for teams to wrap their heads around and uh, and act upon. So you found an issue. Now we need to get to the root cause of what's going on. Two things to look at data integrity issue um, and uh, monitoring there, and then drift analytics, what's actually going on and what's important. So data integrity and outlier monitoring, sometimes I talk about that in monitoring, um, but when I think about how I use this, uh, it's really a best practice. You, you wanna be alerted on, you know, kind of a, you know, something that's uh, maybe an error or uh, beyond a threshold. Um, but you may have missing values, you may have the schema mismatch, maybe your business uh, developed a new catalog and you've got new products you need, you know, that are coming in and you may not know right away, but this is the first place I would check if you're, if you're getting alerts uh, and you, you're either getting performance um, degradation or you're seeing some data drift. I always check the, um, the, uh, my data integrity and uh, look at whether maybe something's changed in the business or more often than not, maybe there's a pipeline issue, maybe there's a bug, there's an API that, um, that has changed um, because that just gets that whole area off your plate before you dive deeper into um, analytics and explainability. So once you're ready to do that, um, you want to take a look uh, at drift analytics. And this is where you've identified there's an issue and you're now uh, comparing that to, let's say, your data distribution. You're looking at that drift divergence, trying to understand what's going on. And then you'll want to attribute, you know, for this time segment, um, which features are more uh, important, which ones impact the global uh, prediction, which ones are maybe impacting just a regional um, decision or, or a smaller uh, slice of data, and then drill down into that affected traffic as well. And these are, this process is where you want to work with your data scientists, you want to bring in your, um, your domain experts to help you kind of drill in and use explainability as well um, so you can understand what you're seeing and monitoring and can kind of uh, get to the root cause. Now, of course, you want to fix it once you found an issue. Uh, this may be updating a pipeline. Maybe you need to fix a violation, incorporate new data. 
Maybe you need to retrain or adapt your model. Maybe you just need to refresh the data that you're training on. Maybe you need to weight different features. Maybe you need to collect different data. Uh, and so looking at your model um, is often, you know, an area that um, that you end up drilling into. You might also just need to do model management. Uh, we talked about periodicity. So you might find that you want to schedule models um, to be valid during certain um, seasons uh, or change maybe your balancing of your ensemble model as well. So with that quick overview of machine learning drift, uh, hopefully some tidbits. If you want more information, you can check it out. Check us out on Fiddler or uh, ping me if you just want to dive deeper or are looking for more resources. So I uh, thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time. Mm -hmm.